This is Transfiguration Sunday, the last Sunday in Epiphany for Year C of the Lectionary Series. This is the last week of Epiphany, and Epiphany comes from the Greek word epiphano, which means to reveal or to manifest or disclose something. And in particular, Epiphany was picked up by the church to refer to a manifestation or a revealing of God's divine glory. It's like a crack in the door between this world and the next, opens up and for a split second you get a glimmer of the divine that shines through. In the Gospels, this started with the Magi's visitation. These pagans had seen a sign about Jesus in the heavens and traveled from the east to bring him gifts as a tribute. It's only fitting that on this, the last Sunday after Epiphany, that Jesus' transfiguration on the mountain and his healing of the boy at the bottom of the mountain are the texts that we read out of the Gospel in the lectionary. Once again, we have another Epiphany, or manifestation of Jesus' divinity. And this is why this Sunday is known as Transfiguration Sunday, this year in the lectionary cycle. Let's look at part one of this story and read... Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And while they were praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he had said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved Son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one of the things they had seen. Now this story is recorded in Matthew 17 and this passage in Luke 9. It is an incredibly complex story loaded with Old Testament references symbolism, and theological meaning. There's no way to cover all this in one video. Perhaps we can revisit this passage again in the future. What I'd like to do this week is take a slightly different, but sort of the same approach to the text. Instead of looking at the textual features in the text and working our way through it, what I'd like to do is look at one of the greatest interpretations ever done on this passage. All too often when we think about biblical interpretation, we only think about text or sermons given on a passage. Art is another form of biblical interpretation, and it discloses aspects on a biblical passage that a paper written on or a sermon cannot. About 20 years ago, I worked as a consultant on a remake of the Jesus movie, this time from a woman's perspective. And I can remember one day I was getting email after email after email from one of the producers. They were asking questions about Jesus and the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Finally, I got a phone call from one of them because email was not working fast enough. They wanted to know about the well that Jesus and this woman met at. Did these wells have any sort of woodwork around them? Probably not. Did they have a wall around them? Maybe. How high was the wall? I don't know. This is about the point where I began to get a bit flustered because I worked with text, not pictures. And this story doesn't tell you anything about what this well looked like except for the fact that Jesus and the woman met there. I told them that and asked why they had so many questions about this well. They responded, It's because I have guys building the set for this shot, and they keep asking me questions like, how high should we make the wall? Should it be made out of brick, stone, or mud? Should it be round or square? And I realized when they were interpreting this passage to put it on film, they were asking questions about the story that I never asked as someone who just studied the words on the page. And how they filmed it was going to be an interpretive act. 
but I digress again. What I want to do today is look at Raphael's masterpiece, The Transfiguration that is in the Vatican. In a perfect world, I would actually shoot this video at the Vatican, but money, time, and travel issues right now make that all but a pipe dream. Who knows, maybe someday in the future. Not only is this painting considered Raphael's finest work, but many consider it the finest exposition ever given on Jesus' transfiguration. Some, though, feel that it's a rather confused work because Raphael combines Jesus' transfiguration and the story of the healing of the boy at the bottom of the mountain into one work of art. In fact, prior to Raphael, no one combined these two stories together into one work of art. Pietro Perugino did at least two depictions of the Transfiguration a few years before Raphael. Notice how he only focuses on the Transfiguration, only half of the story. Look at how Raphael interprets the first half of this story. He separates the two halves of this story by a dark band across the middle. Above, we have the Transfiguration. Below, the story of the boy that the apostles could not heal. This entire work is highly organized and structured. The first thing we notice is the circular composition in the upper half. Jesus is the central figure. The brightness of the cloud behind him and his elevation immediately draw our attention to him. Moses and Elijah are to the right and the left of Jesus. Peter, James, and John collapse under his feet. And we have two smaller mystery figures off to the left. We'll come back to them in a moment. Notice how Jesus is looking heavenward. Someone or something loftier and unseen is above him that captures his attention. Now keep that in mind, because over 150 years ago, the famous British artist Joseph Turner wrote about the structure of Raphael's work. Turner did an analysis of the figures in the upper half and found that each figure occupies a very neat and precise location when laid out with triangles. If we overlay Turner's diagram over top of Raphael's painting, we can see that the top of the main triangle lays just outside the frame of the painting. This leads us to read Jesus' glance as looking up to God, the unseen actor in this image and in Luke's text as well. The disciples hear God's voice in the story, but they don't see him. Jesus' elevation off the ground is intentional on Raphael's part. We know this because we have copies of his charcoal studies that he did when he was preparing to do this work. In those, Jesus is on the ground with the others. But by elevating Jesus in the finished work, Raphael is showing that the apostles are not of the same order as Jesus. By placing him in the clouds, he indicates his heavenly nature. And by having him elevate with Elijah and Moses, who have died and gone to heaven, Raphael shows Jesus' transcendent nature. All of this communicates the nature and the theology that comes through this epiphany. Now, what about these two guys down here on the left-hand side in the upper part of the picture? They're not in the biblical story at all. So who are they? Raphael was commissioned by Cardinal Guidi de Michiti for the cathedral at Narbonne, France. Now, there's a mouthful for you. And the two young men in the painting are the saints Justice and Pastor. They were martyred at a young age, around 10 years old, for their faith, around 300 AD under Diocletian, and they were patron saints for this cathedral. By placing them in this image, Raphael intends to show us that Justice and Pastor have gotten to witness Jesus' transfiguration. Not that they were there on that mountain with the other disciples, but he compresses time to show how these saints have gotten to see Jesus in his glory. It's what we call a temporal compression. We do this all the time as well. If I said, Raphael would approve of my analysis of his art. Now, Raphael is not here with me. He died hundreds of years ago. By using language in this way, I create a blend in which Raphael is approving of this video. He's present with me now. By the way, thanks, Raphael. But there's another blend taking place here as well. Raphael's painting was done around 1520, when the worshiper viewed it and then engaged with that work of art originally. It was contemporaneous with them. 
Raphael's work creates additional layers of temporal compression. Now this altar piece was commissioned for the Feast of the Transfiguration, which we celebrate this epiphany today and witness it as well. Justice and Pastor also help link this image together. One of them is in the position of prayer, the proper response to an epiphany. The other points and leads our eyes to the story below. They link the scenes together and show understanding that the disciples do not have below. This image would have been front and center above the altar at the very front of the cathedral. Now this helps us to understand their position in the image. They are not dressed in the vestments of a priest, but in that of a deacon that they would have worn during the mass. Being on the left hand side is where the deacons would have stood during the service when they read that portion of the gospel out loud from the lectionary for Transfiguration Sunday. This creates a blend for between the deacons reading and justice and pastor in the painting. This compression or blending of time and space also extends to the priest who would have faced the congregation at the center of the altar when they gave the blessing. And they would have raised their hands like Christ did in the painting when they said that prayer. You can see how this painting interacts with the biblical account and the active worship service that was taking place within the cathedral. Now, what about the bottom half of this painting? Many commentators think that Raphael's connection between the transfiguration and the story of the epileptic boy have little in common. But first, before we get into that, let's read the second half of the story and then we'll come back and look at Raphael's work. Luke 9, 37 through 43. On the next day when they came down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And while he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all astonished at the greatness of God. So why would Raphael have linked the two stories together when no one before him did? There are numerous links between these two stories, and I'm only going to touch on a few of them here. First off, Jesus goes up onto the mountain, and then the next day they come down, making a nice narrative path, and also a nice trajectory within the painting here, above and below, on the mountain and down below. Second, above, God the Father talks about Jesus. Below, the boy's father talks about his son. Above, God rebukes the disciples, and down below, Jesus will rebuke the disciples and the crowd. Finally, both Matthew and Luke link these two stories together. They could have separated them as they sometimes do, or omitted one or the other part, but the fact that they include them both in the same order, I think, shows that they saw a theological link between these two stories. Raphael linked these two stories together into a single, incredibly complex image. The upper half is bathed with light, the lower in darkness. Light is good, darkness is bad. Day above, night below represent the conflict between good and evil, between revelation and ignorance in the two halves of the story. Turning our attention to the lower panel, there's a lot going on here, so I'm only going to focus on, let's say, four or five features for the sake of time. First off, the figures in the lower half are separated into two groups by a dark swath down the middle of them. On the right hand side, we have the family that brought their son to the disciples. The way Raphael depicts this group fading off into the background getting smaller conveys the idea of a path and a journey, and this matches the text in the idea of bringing the child to the disciples. Second, the two groups are portrayed in very different manners. The family grouping are all focused on the disciples for help. The disciples, by contrast, are portrayed in complete disarray. They are looking and pointing in every different direction, showing their lack of unity and understanding as to who Jesus is. Third, the figure seen in the very lower left has a huge book. 
He looks at the child, but at the same time is gesturing with his hand at us. Stop. Wait. He wants us to stop and think about this image. We know from various indications in Renaissance art that Raphael wants us to understand that this is Matthew, who recorded the other account of this story. By turning from the book, most likely symbolizing the Old Testament, he is telling us that there is nothing like this there. And second, as the author of one of the Transfiguration accounts, Raphael is using him to tell us that we need to learn from this story. Fourth, the musculature of this kid is amazing. He is built like Arnold. Why would he have depicted this kid as so muscle-bound? Well, during the medieval period, epilepsy was often referred to as Morbus Hercules after the Greek hero Hercules. Some believe that Hercules was able to perform his feats by falling into a trance or a seizure. In this sense, Raphael blends the boy's musculature with Morbus Hercules to let the viewer know that he thought that this boy suffered from what we would call epilepsy today. Finally, we come to the well-coiffed woman at the very center of the lower panel. Her inclusion has puzzled art historians for centuries. There are several very interesting features about her. First, she is not in the biblical story. Raphael adds her to this account. Second, notice that no one is looking at her in this image, except perhaps Matthew, but many think that Matthew is looking through her to the boy. It's as if she is invisible to the participants in this story. Third, she is not dressed like the other characters in the story. She is dressed in classical Greek clothing and her hair is very elaborately done up. This is why she is known as the well-coached woman. Fourth, it's surprising how many times authors totally skip over any reference to her when they are discussing this image. Fifth, her pose. She is holding a very specific type of pose called the figura serpentata. This pose was used in Renaissance works of art to connect or to transition from one part of an image to another. So what does she represent? I think there's a couple of options. She may represent faith because that is what the disciples lacked in the story. In this case, she's telling the disciples to have faith and they can heal the boy. She may be standing in place of Jesus. Notice how she takes a central position in the lower panel, just as Jesus takes the central position in the upper panel. And just like Jesus above, she is bathed in light below. In this case, she seems to be telling the disciples, you should be doing this. Why aren't you? They need to understand who Jesus truly is as seen above. If they understood this, then they would be able to meet the needs of this family. Finally, as an altarpiece, Raphael's work would have been inside a frame with two doors or image that closed over it. There would have been a great deal of drama about this work and when you actually got to see it. This image would have been opened only on a few select feast days within the church calendar. As such, for the average viewer, attending Mass when this altarpiece was open would have been like attending a major Hollywood motion picture blockbuster release. Everyone would have crowded forward to get the best view possible of this incredible work of art. And it would have been open for all to view during Mass on this Transfiguration Sunday. If you like this explanation of Raphael's work and how he interprets the biblical text, let me know in the comments below. Who knows, I might get to do more videos like this in the future if I get a lot of comments along those lines. The key thing though is we need to learn what this woman is trying to teach us in this painting. Till then, peace.